here's Leonard all the way from Ohio coming to see us and say hello Leonard how you doing I'm good Ted how are you man oh I'm doing good I'm I'm surviving here in, in the uh, the jungle, the concrete jungle they call Honolulu. And uh, where are you coming to us today? I'm in Dover, Ohio. It's unseasonably wow. warm here. It's like, I think it's like 50 degrees. It should be like around 30. Let me look. Hold on one second. It is... 52 degrees in Dover, Ohio. No, 59. 59. Well, that that's better than 52. Yeah, but, but <laughs> normally, like uh, uh, Monday, it will be uh, 39. Mm -hmm. You know. So, uh, hey, thank God for global warming. Okay. Well, you. I like it. I like your attitude. You're a positive guy. Now we should have some chat going as soon as we get a few people online, it might realize that we're on here, but we're starting small. So please bear with me. Don't get discouraged people. We're, we're going to grow like the tiny acorn into the mighty oak. But, but Leonard is, uh, Leonard is a musician. He's a Christian music musician, worship leader, minister, and we've been friends, uh, I don't know, a long time, seems like been um, forever, but uh, we met uh, 15 years ago, I guess, when you and your wife came and visited us in Hawaii and played some churches here, and we got to hang out, and we had a great time, and since that time, I, I used to be an airline pilot. I don't know if the people view and know that, but uh, I had the honor to fly you to Japan. You were going to Japan quite a lot, and you were traveling the world and playing music and teaching uh, worship, and uh, I want to hear a little bit about some of your adventures, but tell me first, tell me where did this all begin? Tell me how you got started and where were you born Leonard? I was born in Schenectady, New York. Uh, that's uh, a little kind of upstate New York. Oh. And uh, then at a young age, we moved to Florida. And, and then for about my, the first 14 years of my life, my father, he worked in the shipyards and and in florida there was the shipyards in jacksonville florida but up in new york there was the atomic powerhouses and uh so he was a specialized welder so he he could weld you know the the, the stuff that you would use in a atomic powerhouse uh and it's uh so uh we would live in florida for a year literally sell the house move to new york for two years sell the house move to florida because back then you just you didn't just rent houses, you just bought them, you know. And um, so anyway, I grew up uh, at, at a age of four. I my father had a whole bunch of musicians come over to our house, and uh, and they were all playing, and my dad was singing, and that uh, that changed my life. And. Uh... When did you discover that you had some talent for music? When did you realize that you wanted to do music in your life? Probably when I was about four. Our, our little screens have gotten bigger for some reason. Yeah, I'm trying to monkey around with this. It's not working. Uh, so, and then you I kept going at it. You know, started out on a ukulele. You know, from there I went to a, I think it, it was a silver tone, four string guitar. It was like taking the top four strings of a six string guitar, just the high strings and got that. And then, and then when I was somewhere around the age of maybe 10 or something, I, I, uh, my dad had bought a silver tone guitar that was that had the 
the amplifier was inside of the guitar case. Okay. And, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, and I got rid of that guitar. And guess who I saw playing the exact same guitar about 20 years later was Jimmy Page with uh, Led Zeppelin. And I'm going, you got rid of that guitar. Ah. <laughs> uh, and so anyway, uh, I... I started playing in band. I started taking guitar lessons at 13 from a very good jazz player. By the time I was 14, I was actually playing in clubs with him, uh, doing jazz type music. And, um, and then I got ruined when I was 16. And uh, when Cream, a group called Cream with Eric Clapton came out. Oh, yeah. Went, oh, my gosh. Now that's how to play the guitar. And so my my guitar teacher hated me for it, you know, because he was a strict jazz player. Uh, at the age of 19, pretty much right on my birthday, I went into the Air Force and uh, got stationed in Germany, played in bands when I was there in the Air Force. Um, when I got out of the Air Force, I went. Uh, I thought, well, what am I going to do? I, I can't. So I went into went to music college. I had the GI Bill. Uh, studied uh, composition theory. Went through four years of that, uh, and played with the Jacksonville Symphony for a couple of years. Had bands. I had a band uh, with uh, just a whole bunch of different bands. And then I, I uh, ended up working uh, at uh, CBN with Pat Robertson for a while. And after that, I went to PPL with Jim Baker. And when that fell apart, uh, uh, be in between that, I had a band with a couple of guys from a group called Leonard Skinner, uh, Billy Powell and uh, uh, Leon Wilkerson, who was bass player and keyboard player. They're both dead now, but uh, they had gotten saved. Uh, that group was called Vision, and they, you can actually still, on YouTube, you can find Vision. There's no videos, but there's a lot, a lot of the music. Just put, just type in Vision, Billy Powell, Leon Wilkerson, or Leonard Skinner or something like that. Leonard Skinner. And so from that, I went, uh, I worked worked at PTL. PTL fell apart. Uh, and somehow or another, I got hooked up with a guy named Rick Joyner after that. And Rick Joyner uh, had written a book uh, called um, There Were Two Trees in the Garden. And it, it was a pretty big uh, hit. And I went on board with them. Uh, the, he didn't have any churches or anything. He paid me to go out in the woods in a little cabin and just worship the Lord by myself. And so that was my job. You know, I clocked in and I went back and worshiped the Lord for eight hours. And um, so I cut my teeth on uh, a lot of Christian worship during that time. You know, up until that time, I'd played like maybe... Um, like Christian rock, like the, the, the group Vision was, it, it sounded like Leonard Skinner singing worship songs. Uh, and uh, we had two albums that are very good albums. And so I'm just trying to make a real quick, uh, so I was, I was with Morningstar for 20 years. So when did that start? When What year are we talking about now? What period? The 80s? Uh... Seven. At Morningstar, I started in 93. Okay. I believe it was 93. Um, in 1996, we cut four pretty successful CDs, all, all from the same uh, conference called uh, Vision, uh, Worship, Glory, and Warfare. And they became uh, huge sellers. I mean, and to this day, if you talk with the people at Bethel or if you talk to 
the people I'm working with right now, uh, Christ, Christ for All Nations with Daniel Kalenda, those those were the albums that changed their lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because nobody was doing anything creative up until that time. And, uh, it, and so we became very, very popular. Our conferences were huge. And um, it would... Uh, it would not be uncommon for during a conference to look out and of course we didn't know who they were, but you know, Brian and Jen Johnson would be in the audience, you know, or Jason Upton. A lot of people came just to see what was going on because of the worship that we were producing. And this was in, uh, in the barn, I think they called it, wasn't it? The big building there more, this was in the nineties. Is that right? Yeah, we did we did, we did stuff in the barn. We did stuff in Jacksonville, Florida, at uh, New Life. We did mm -hmm. hotel hell, hotels around. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, and then about ten years ago, uh, I quit and started doing uh, worship schools around the world. And that was when I started going to Japan a lot, and I was going to Brazil crazy, you know. Uh, I think I went to Japan 10 times. I went to Brazil probably 20 times, um, uh, all over the Middle East, all over, uh, Europe, you know, uh, and, and then, uh, you know, to be honest, I just got tired of traveling. Yeah. I can identify with that as a pilot and uh, you were hitting it hard. I know you were gone all the time. Sometimes, uh, I'd buy those tickets that you could go one direction and go all the way around the world. <laughs> you know, and, wow. And I would buy a, a, a literally, literally around the world ticket. I'd go to England and I'd go to Europe, you know, and then I'd go to Japan and then I'd go to Australia and then I'd go to Hawaii. I think on one of those trips I stopped in mm -hmm. Hawaii too. Yeah. Yeah. I'd go to, <laughs> then I'd come into California and do stuff across the states back home. And those trips sometimes would be six weeks, you know, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, and that's, and then I, I started getting um, the idea for, you, you know, as I started growing older, I realized I don't like traveling. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, so I, I started some worship schools. I did a worship, a very successful worship school in Ehrenhut, Germany. Uh, Herrenhut is where the uh, Moravian church started. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, you know, it, it, uh, that, that around the world trip that I took, all, I just took brochures, you know, with me. And I, I think I collected uh, somewhere around 40 students for the school in Germany. It was six weeks long and it was awesome. Uh, and that's when I realized that's, I really want to do that, uh, but I, I couldn't do schools and travel at the same time. And then Rick Joyner asked me if I would come back to Morningstar and, and take care of their school. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, so I, uh, said, yeah, I can't, I went back and I, I worked with them for a couple of years. Um, and, and then I just decided, you know, I, I, I it just wasn't working out for either of us. Uh, mm -hmm. and and that's when i moved up here to ohio and i just the last day of this school is tomorrow that i'm doing right now mm -hmm. and, uh, but about six weeks ago no about six months ago uh there's a guy named daniel kalenda he's in charge of, of a ministry called christ for all nations mm -hmm. and uh uh, most anybody that's watching would know who Reinhard Bonnke was. He did these humongous crusades in Africa where uh, sometimes there'd be over a million people in the audience at the same time. Yeah. And uh, Daniel was his protege. Daniel took over the ministry. Reinhardt died maybe four or five years ago, I think, maybe. Uh, okay. Let, yeah. let me, yeah, excuse me to, just to interrupt a minute. Let me uh, jump in and say... Uh, uh, let, let's take a brief break here, and uh, I'm going to play one of your music things uh, in the background. We're just going to take a, just a real quick break, 
But you stay there, Leonard. Don't go anywhere. And I want to find out about Reinhard Bonnke. I want to know, I want to let the people know a little bit more about, you know, what you do uh, and how you do everything. But uh, I want people to see what you do as uh, you've been playing, not just to talk about your music all the time. So... Yeah. Stay with us, folks. We'll be right back in just a brief minute. Thank you. here thank you folks I, I had to check on my doggy for a minute you there leonard i'm here oh thank you well all right i hope people could enjoy a little of your music and i think you know just to give people a taste of what you do and your very unique style and uh before we hear more about what you're doing i mean i'd like to know just uh what what is it that you do i mean that you think is different what makes you different from other artists and worship artists i mean i know you you have incorporated many instruments you're a master of uh, apparently all the string instruments you play mandolin guitar uh, sitar uh, and keyboards but and now you have written a symphony also <laughs> so but, but can you just we'll back up just a minute how how do you write do you go from bible verses or how did you what where do you get your inspiration and uh, maybe who were your early uh who were your early influences you know to help you start uh, I've, I've got probably hundreds of influences I've gone through stages where I, um, I'll i pick up uh, like an instrument and just learn how to play it just because I've heard it somewhere. That's how I learned how to play the violin. I was, uh, I would have been somewhere around 19 or 20 and, and I, there was a band back in those days, nobody had ever heard 
violin in a rock band. Uh, and I heard this band called It's a Beautiful Day. And and I heard the violin. I went, I'm going to learn how to play that. And I found, and I got me a violin in, uh, uh, in Germany. And uh, when I came back to the United States, practiced it for about a, six weeks or so. Um, no, six months. And learned a Bach uh, sonata, uh, violin sonata piece. And... And I went to the college uh, there, and I I had only been playing for six months, and I played uh, violin. I played played it for him, and I got a full time scholarship. So that's how I ended up going to music school. Are you still there? You're not. I don't see you. I'm, I'm here. I didn't go away. I just wanted to spotlight you while you were talking. And <laughs> you're getting lonely, okay. Uh, so I, I learned about a lot of instruments that way and a lot of styles. Um, I, I went through a huge classical music style, uh, part of my life. I went through uh, bluegrass stage. I went through Irish music stage. I went through Indian uh, music, uh, you know, for India, not American Indian. I obviously went through the rock and roll stage and I'd never gotten out of that. Uh, and I went through a jazz stage where that's all I wanted to play was jazz. Uh, so all of those influences consequently come up in my music. Like you, like I can have one song that sounds very much like an Irish jig, you know, and, but the next song I do could sound like something you'd hear, you know, in, you know, Russia somewhere. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's just it just kind of depends on so my, but my writing style it changes all the time i just get these ideas in my head and like the symphony i wrote uh, i'm almost finished with um i i i ended up taking i went i was um i, t I took a film scoring class at berkeley last year and right right and then um so the first part of this year, I took a um, advanced orchestration class uh, at Berkeley, and I really, uh, I really liked it. And uh, I actually took one of my Irish fiddle tunes and used it and orchestrated it. It's called King's Kids. Uh, you can find it on uh, YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, and and then I, uh, you know, the COVID thing started really bearing down on us. And so I just had a lot of time, you know, to write. So I just was writing while I was, uh, as soon as I finished that course, that was, a, I think that, start, that ended in April. I just started writing the symphony uh, and uh, I call it um, uh, symphony uh, CVXIX. That's, you named it for me. <laughs> and I, I call it a, it's a uh, symphonic diary of COVID-19. And it's very good. The problem is symphonies aren't playing anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, mm -hmm. you can't go see a symphony right now. Mm -hmm. I can't even get even any of the major symphonies to look at it. Uh, the, uh, I did get one, I, I've gotten a couple of groups. One, of, one, one was a, an online symphony that, you know, puts together these online uh, videos of them doing a symphony. And uh, the guy wrote me back and he really loved it. He said, but it's just too hard for them. I mean, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's just a lot. There's a lot going on. Uh, they were doing stuff like Brahms, but the easy Brahms, not the hard stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm a little bit discouraged on that. I'm on, I'm on, I, I wrote. I finished three movements, which is about 40 minutes worth of music. Mm -hmm. And I was, I'm about three and a half minutes into the fourth movement. And I've kind of like not been doing it because then my worship school started up here and I just didn't have time to do it. Uh, so uh, anyway, that's how that, you know, but, but about, uh, I think it was two years ago, I was up here in Cleveland. And uh, I was doing a, a, the, a call with uh, Lou Engel, and I was mm -hmm. with uh, um, Rick Pino, and I 
can't remember who else I, I, I I'm not sure if Misty was at that conference or not. Uh, but, uh, and I'm sitting on the sideline, you know, just waiting for Rick to go on. And this guy came up to me, big old muscular guy. And he goes, hey, my name's Daniel. And it was Daniel Kalenda. And he goes, man, I, I grew up in your music. I, I it, like, you're one of the best musicians I know. And he said, I'm, uh, and, and he's just, yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> so um, he said, it felt like, you know, that we're going to do something together someday. And mm -hmm. then he came to Morningstar a few months after that and did a conference with us, and he said the same thing. And then for about a year went by, and I hadn't heard from him. Now, about six months ago, he, uh, he you know, wrote me, I mean, he called me and, and he said, you know, I'd really be interested in um, you doing your worship school here in uh, Orlando with us. And, and so I, uh, we've been in a lot of uh, negotiations on that. And uh, uh, January the 28th, we're doing a conference in Orlando. It's called the Fire Conference. It's uh, Todd White is going to be there, Daniel Kalenda, uh, uh, a whole bunch of really good speakers. Uh, Sean Foyt's going to be doing worship. So is uh, uh, me and Amber Brooks and Eddie James, uh, Naomi, Naomi Cantrell, uh, Jenny Weaver. So it's going to be a pretty, pretty amazing conference. Uh, and uh, after that conference, I'm actually going to stay in Florida and start working at CFAN, you know, getting the getting the curriculum all set up for the school. Cool, cool. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> now, just for a little break so people can see a little more what you do, I queued up something while you were talking, and this is called Resurrection Song. Uh, can you give us a little bit about that? Uh, or let me play a little bit here and then you might want to, you might tell us a little more about it. So this is the one at Morningstar Resurrection Song. That's, that's really cool stuff. So tell me. My son is playing the drums in that video. Oh, that's your son. Awesome. Awesome. Well, tell us a little bit about that while uh, I'm going to, we'll let that run here in the background, but let me see if I can get, uh, get us back both on here. Okay. Tell us a little about your musicians. I know your son's a very gifted drummer. And uh, Luke Skaggs, Ricky Skaggs' son, is also, he's in your group there. Can you tell us Yeah, a little more? Yeah, Luke was, um, Luke and Mo Molly, were, Molly Skaggs, who, who did the song recently, uh, There Ain't No Grave, that was a, a, a copy of, a, I mean, a, a version of Johnny Cash's song, Ain't No Grave. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so both of them worked for me, uh, and Amber Brooks who did the song uh, Like You Promise, which is like the number one song in all of um, South America. And Amber Brooks is actually going to work, be working with me at CFAN also. 
Mm -hmm. Orlando. Uh, I I have really good musicians that play with me. Um, the the bass player for Dolly Parton, uh, Gary Lund plays with me. The drummer uh, for John Mark McMillan and uh, Jason Upton, Al Sergo plays with me. Uh, the keyboard player that's playing with me right now, uh, ooh, gosh, she's played with everybody. Uh, well, I have two key keyboard players that will be down in Florida with me. One of them, oh, what's, uh, I'm not familiar with all, all these names, but, um, I can't remember, but, um, yeah, everybody, I, I, I try to use real high quality musicians because, uh, well, the Bible, you know, is very clear. It says, play skillfully unto the Lord, you know, and uh, the kind of music I write, you can't just use like what you normally in a normal church setting, you know, what's popular right now is like four chord songs. Uh, and uh, my, my songs have a lot more than that going on. Um, I'm not saying it's going to ever make me popular. But there's there's certain people that my songs touch that those other songs don't touch. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. and vice versa. My songs, there's certain people that don't, my songs don't touch people. They like those easy, right. easy right. songs. And so, uh, I mean, you know, I just, I, I, I've been so grateful that I've been able to kind of do, uh, you know, anything that I've wanted to do musically. Uh, one really good thing for, I was with Rick Joyner for 20 years. And the good part about Rick Joyner was he didn't care. You know, he, it's like. He was the pastor of Morningstar uh, Ministry. Yeah, yeah, the people don't know, but yeah, he was a big name. He is a big name guy. Yeah. Very famous author. Uh, but the, the good part is he didn't know anything about music. Mm-hmm. And so consequently, he couldn't say, hey, I want this, this, and this. He just let us do anything that we wanted. And as long as the people were involved in worshiping, he didn't care. Mm -hmm. It's not normal. That's not a typical. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's, uh, he's not typical. You're not typical. <laughs> I think that's what's so great about you. And, and uh, you're really a pioneer in, in my opinion because that's how i found you back in the 90s <laughs> seemed like forever long time ago but you were uh, doing the music that i had never seen anything like what you were doing and uh, i'm going to try and pull up something here in a minute but you were doing you had kevin prosh and you had don potter uh and you guys were changing everything I, I think and everybody else seemed to think so and that was uh in the 90s right and and uh and it went from there i i you know i believed that you are one of the fathers of the contemporary christian music uh movement and uh you know as a father uh, you influence many younger people, and you have a lot of, of artists now that you help bring up. You'd mention them, Luke Skagg, Molly Skaggs, and uh, what other artists have you been, you know, you felt you've had input to and contact with? I'm sure there's a many, too many to count, but uh, not that they're more important, but you, who, who would you think that people might know, or who did you have a big influence on? Well, we had a ministry school that that had worship track uh, at Morningstar, and we had uh, John Mark McMillan and Sarah McMillan. They, they came through that school. John wrote, John Mark wrote a song called "Oh How He Loves Us," and uh, and then Sarah wrote like, a couple of years ago a song called uh, "King of My Heart." We had Johnny and Melissa Halser come through our school. Uh, Johnny, you know, uh, was, you know, uh, what's the name of that song? Uh, ain't, uh, no Longer Slave. Uh, Kim Walker came through for a term. Uh, we had um, Josh Baldwin, who's now with Bethel, that uh, 
he came through Amber Brooks, who who will be working with me at CFAN. She came through the school. Uh, Kalani, a girl named Kalani Gluckler, uh, came through also. Uh, just a number of, and there, there's a number of musicians that not, you know, that weren't extremely, never got really famous, but their their songs are just ridiculously beautiful. And, and, um, and we, had, we had an emphasis on um, creativity and on individuality at Morningstar. And that's really the hallmark of my schools that I do is uh, we're, you know, uh, in order to have longevity to what you do, uh, you have to either have any crazy good style, you know, that will last, or you have to have a lot of education so that you can move through the stages that, that happen in, in music and in the uh, worship world. Uh, mm -hmm. I happen to have a lot of education, so I've been able to kind of stay ahead of the curve most of the time. Mm -hmm. And that's what I believe... Uh, and that's what I try to instill into my students. It's like, okay, if, if, if this is what you want to do for your life, you really have to be prepared. Mm -hmm. You can't just go in, uh, uh, you know, you have those people that have made it through, you know, like if, if Stevie Wonder went out on the road right now, he's probably close to 75 at least. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. He would sell out everywhere he went. Because mm -hmm. he has a style, but he's also a fantastic musician. You know, yeah. The same yeah. with Paul McCartney. The same with, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's just a just a whole bunch of the musicians that came up during that era. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Elton John, any of those guys, they can draw an audience. You know, and you, these are old people like me. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Uh, and because they created a style, you know, and there's a word for the, the words, and I can't remember the, the actual Greek word, uh, but the, it's, it, and you might, since you're Greek, it, the, the word for education is actually, they use, it's not putting, it's not putting th something into somebody, it's pulling something out of them. Exactly right. Yeah, I mean, it's bring out, draw out from you, from inside and that's that's what my schools are about we're not i mean we you have to put something in sometimes to get it out and you know mm -hmm. but, but my whole thing like tomorrow uh uh now this la this school uh be it was uh because of covid you know it, it's very small four i had four full-time students and but if every one of those students well, five, five including my intern uh, uh, every one of those students are going to be doing a an original song that they wrote, uh, and and the styles are crazy different. You know, one of them is a just a blatant rock song. The other sounds like it could have been written in nineteen thirties. Uh, uh, a Russian girl that is uh, who actually has been living at Marla and my house during school. Uh, she wrote that, oh, and we have one of the uh, the pastor's daughter-in-law. Uh, she came through the school. Her songs, uh, maybe uh, I think it's kind of a, uh, a, a it's a really good worship song. And then uh, then uh, another one of my students, uh, his songs is it's a, it's a little bit kind of folky, you know. So we have four different styles tomorrow. Plus, I'll be doing a song. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, uh, I it's on YouTube. If you if you put on YouTube, uh, Leonard Jones slash Mozart. Right. We start doing. We start with uh, me and a string quartet doing a Mozart string quartet, and then I go into Keep My Eyes on You, where we're actually doing a version of that song tomorrow with with the Mozart. Uh, and so, uh, you know. <laughs> God is uh, God is very creative, and He likes creative. He's drawn to creativity, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Well, I, I definitely, I definitely agree with you. And that's one of the things that I have loved so much about you and what you've done for me and many other people uh, is show us that there's not any right and wrong or just one way, but you can be yourself, bring your own music in. Now, here we are. <laughs> Let's jump back. <laughs> this is the, this is the barn, right? Right. And this is the early, early days. We're going to see very young Leonard Jones. This is back to, to the 90s here. Yep, me with, me with, me with a ball. <laughs> this is one of your really classic big ones called We Wait. Now you have to remember, folks, that at this time of the world, this wasn't really done. <laughs> this is back when people were with stringy black ties and slick back hair, just about. <laughs> and here's a, a whole different, refreshing way. Well, feel free to make any comments if you like, Leonard, about you know your group who's playing and what was going on. This was the heart of David Worship Conference, I believe. Yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Yeah, this was done in 1990. Yeah. used to be a background singer for a lot of very famous country bands. And she got saved at that concert. Wow. Water, That's Terry. Is it Terry McMillan playing Congress? Now, who's the lady dancing in the white skirt? I think it is, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So that's you over here on the right with the white strata casket with the white shirt. That's Don Potter with his wife on the left. And this man, who's this man? Keep going. Well, they're going to go, and we're going to let this play in the background, but I, I want to talk with you a little more. And, and they go into a really cool drum solo here in a minute. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, can you just tell us so... Uh, Tell us the story about Don Potter and, and Christina, his wife. I mean, you told me a story about them in Nashville at the studio, and and they ran into a very famous rock and roller, and she she prayed for him. You yeah. know what I'm talking about. You you, you want to share that with us? Yeah, uh, this was after Don had left Morningstar. Uh, he was back on the road with. Uh, uh, 
the Judd girl. What's her name? Naomi Judd? Naomi Judd, yeah. Not Naomi. Who's the... Uh... No, Allison Krauss, was it? Was he with... Uh, he was doing it. We're talking about Led Zeppelin uh, Robert singer, Plant. Robert Plant. They were, was... the, they were in the same uh, rehearsal space as, uh, as the Judds. Mm-hmm. John was playing with the Judds, but Allison was doing a... Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, she was getting ready to do a tour with Robert Plant from Led mm. Zeppelin, and mm. uh, and since uh, Don had had been working on a CD for Allison, uh, he went in uh, to talk with her, and uh, Christine came in, and she just was in the corner, you know, and then she uh, she saw this long haired older guy off off to the side and and the lord gave her a word for him and she just walked over and she said do you mind if i pray for you and, and, uh, just a second i want to just jump in with your drums here this was so cool it's not the normal church service yeah. That's Christina there, right? The white, white haired lady. I just didn't want to miss this part. Please go ahead with the story so that she found Robert Plant alone in the studio and she asked to pray for him. Well, uh, she didn't know who he was. Uh huh. Uh, she just walked up to her and she, she asked him, uh, do you mind if I pray for you? And, and uh, he goes, no, I'll go ahead. And so she started praying for him and then she started giving him the, the word and he just started crying and just the Lord was just all over him. And, um, you know, uh, at, when the, they left, uh, Alison Krauss is a Christian, so she was kind of used to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so when they left on, on their way back to the house, um, uh, Christine asked Donna, she goes, who was that guy? <laughs> and Donna mm -hmm. goes, uh oh, you don't, you didn't know who that was. That that's uh, Robert Plant. That's the lead singer for Led Zeppelin. And she goes, oh. <laughs> so that's. <laughs> that way. She, she's like a. Uh, she, she's John the Baptist. She's a fire <laughs> Pentecostal full on. But it, it it seems that they had an effect on him. I mean, absolutely. Uh, he seemed to be talking more about different kind of things about, you know, not the normal Led Zeppelin stuff. Right. Yeah. And you never know. I mean, we're talking about religion and church and those things, but actually it seemed like church is, uh, is, the, is us, the people, and we have to take it outside, outside the four walls. And that's what you're very good at doing. And uh, uh, you were in Philadelphia, I understand, back here uh, a couple months ago. You were playing at uh, Constitution Hall, you and some, some musicians. The field outside of that, yes. Yeah. Well, um, I know that you, you know, you traveled and you, you know, you made your living just as traveling teacher, evangelist, musician. You told me about a time in Europe, you said, when 
you know, everybody that's in ministry, probably more uh, ministry people would be interested in this, but you do things by faith and you live by faith and you only just take offerings. You don't charge, like just charge money, you know, but um, you told me once about a, a time when, uh, when you were in Germany or somewhere, you said you got the biggest offering you ever had. You were in a small little attic room with a few people and you had a, some kind of ice cream carton or something you were, Passion. Do you remember that by any chance? You remember the uh, particulars? You told me your biggest offering, I think you, at least from that whole world trip, just from a room with 10 people, and he had a empty cardboard uh, ice cream carton for the for the collection basket. Uh, I don't know. It stuck with me. You probably don't remember, but... But nowadays, that they charge uh, artists charge actual fees to do things, and uh, it's it's all completely changed. It's all turned around a lot. So I see you moving around. You have a guitar handy there. Do you or uh, you have something? You uh, you have something? Maybe you would like to do something for us. Uh, I know you have a Christmas album. And maybe we're getting a little long. We might need to wrap up here. This is just for our first time. But I sure appreciate people watching. And I, I know they're going to be watching in the future. And uh, we're going to do more, hopefully, Lord willing. But would certainly love to, uh, you know, hear you to be able to hear you do something if you'd like. And you have a Christmas album. It's just brand new out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't yeah, but I, I just whatever you feel like you would like to do, we we would sure we would enjoy something. Uh, uh, the album is called Silent Night, and it's uh, it's a sea fan, uh, fresh for all nations. It's uh, me and a good friend up here. We just got into my office and we just recorded violin mainly and piano, and did uh, a bunch of Christmas songs, you know, traditional all traditional songs and then Daniel Kalenda and his family did uh, some narrations over the songs um, and it's, it's really cute it's um, so if you go to CFAN uh, silent which which is Christ for all nations right that's the abbreviation right. yeah, CFAN right. I'll put that in the description, by the way, at the bottom here. I'll, I'll put your links and more how they can find your music. But go ahead, please. So they would like that. I mean, it's just a, it's very, it's non-obtrusive. Uh, you know, it'd be, it'd be something that I think kids would really particularly enjoy because these kids a lot are, are telling some of the Christmas stories. On the, mm -hmm. It's it's all instrumental except for that. And that's... Uh, so that's what we did. Uh, that just came out. I just got them the day before yesterday. All right. All right. Let's see if I can turn um, it over on the table. Okay. Uh, yeah, my guests just came back, so I guess we should uh, wipe this out. Okay. We're going to end up with a nice instrumental or music by Leonard Jones here from uh, his new album, Christmas Album. Please, here's Le Leonard Jones, our special guest. Yeah, the, the, let me see if I can. Um, I, I played violin on the album, so <laughs> so like, uh, let me see if I can figure out one of the songs that we did. Uh, uh,
know you were going to make me do that. I'm sorry. That's not fair. I, that doesn't look like a violin, but you, I'm sure you have some song in your head that you can play. Do you? Yeah, and take uh, us out with This is a song I wrote with uh, John Mark McMillan, um, mm -hmm. and um, I haven't even I haven't done it in quite a while, so bear with me. This world has seen the darkest grave it could not keep the purest heart lay drain for out upon the mercy seat. gods of men they stand aside their eyes are blind to my life and when my heart oh, how's it go no longer be I'll sit with you upon the mercy seat.
the one who was, who will always be above the mercy seat. You love your mercy seat. Oh, that's awesome, Leonard. Um, can we have you back again sometime yeah. soon? Yeah. Oh, thank you. This has been awesome. Well, this has been our special guest, Leonard Jones, and we had an up close and personal visit and talk with Leonard. And thank you, Leonard. Thanks for sharing. Uh, let me pray real quick for you and, and all our audience. It's Christmas time. And uh, I've already just, had COVID. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, we're not going to catch it through the screen and you're yeah. good. You're you're good. Well, thank you, Father. We thank you that you are good. Thank you for Christmas time. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. Thank you for people like Leonard that have a heart for you, a heart for worship, that have a gift and that share their gift with us. And thank you that he brings anointing with him. Wherever he goes, he takes the anointing with him for praise of the Father. And uh, he is a father of the worship, modern worship. He he's, uh, has earthly children. He has a wife. And he's a, a good friend, too. So we just ask your blessing on him. Lord, bless all our viewers. We pray that this might touch everyone's life in a good way and uh, increase a hunger for knowing the Lord Jesus especially at this Christmas time. We just pray for peace, peace on earth, and goodwill toward men. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Hey, Leo, thanks again. Uh, it's been an awesome privilege, <laughs> and I really enjoyed talking with you. Me too, man. Okay, we'll do it again soon. And coming, coming. I <laughs> thank you, Leonard. And coming live. From Honolulu, checking out today, saying aloha, peace. We love you all. God bless you. Aloha. Thank you. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs> See you. See you soon. Bye, Leonard. Thanks. <laughs>